poisoning and managing jellyfish poisoning. So we've had a fantastic presentation on uh, the types of jellyfish, their uh, demography, where are they present and what is the pathophysiology of the envenomation, how it happens, very beautifully described, very pictorial. So I am going to, she's made my job so easy. So I'm going to remove all that I'm going to directly to the treatment part of it. Treatment part in two forms, pre-hospital care and in hospital care, in the emergency department. So again, brief introduction, maybe I have a couple of slides where uh, jellyfish also call as nidaria. They use nematocysts and tentacles to stink. Venom is antigenic and can cause dermatonecrosis, hemolysis, neurotoxicity, and cardiotoxicity. The neurotoxicity and the cardiotoxicity are the most common causes of death and severe envenomation. The severity depends on the number of nematocysts discharged. And uh, Dr. Priyavda said that uh, 10 microseconds is what it takes for the, the um, sting to happen and for the venom to be deployed into the person's body. This may result in immediate allergic reaction, immediate toxic or delayed uh, allergic responses, depending on the degree of envenom envenomation in the patient's immunogenic, immunologic response. Mechanism of envenomation, again. So, uh, neurosis are what basically contain the venom and they are the venom delivery apparatus. They're not just um, the, what you call in um, jellyfish, we have this kind of envenomation we see in corals, sea anemones, and other true jellyfish. Uh, neurocytes mature living, are mature living cells that encapsulate neurosis. And the stinging apparatus is found. Just a second. Stinging. Cysts are found in specialized tentacle epithelial cells are also called as battery cells as Dr. Prima has already discussed with us. It triggered to be released in spring-like harpoon mechanism to release hollow tubules with venom in membranes surrounded by hollow barbs. I think we have a similar picture which she has shown how there is an osmotic gradient and the variation which shows and how the harpoon is pushed out and on contact with skin. Now, how do we diagnose envenomation? There are multiple differential diagnoses when you come, when you talk about uh, envenomation, marine um, envenomation, that is not just jellyfish, you keep multiple other um, um, organisms that can probably cause uh, stinging and envenomation. So history of encountering with an animal, typically while surfing, scuba diving, or cleaning an aquarium, or large aquariums, talking about living size aquariums. The sudden onset of pain, single or multiple puncture wounds are one way of diagnosing if there is a possibility of envenomation. Coming to the clinical presentation, uh, there is immediate intense burning pain. As she said, these patients actually want to be put down. They're like, please kill us. We can't bear this pain anymore. That intense can be the pain. And in addition to the burning pain, we can have pap uh, painful papular articarial eruptions at the site of contact, often in a linear streak-like distribution from the long tentacles, they're also called as welts. Lesions may last for a few minutes to hours with pro further progression to vesicular, hemorrhagic, or necrotizing lesions. Depending on how many, how much of envenomation happens, it can be mild to it can become severe, leading to necrotizing lesions further. Pain and paresthesias, severe muscular spasms, respiratory arrest, neurotoxicity, which leads to uh, the paresthesias. Thereby, a lot of times it has been seen that patients, people, victims, are found dead when, while at sea. And probably post-mortem um, discovery turns out that they actually probably would have gone into respiratory paralysis leading to drowning and thereby death. So intense neurotoxicity can happen. There can be other systemic um, symptoms like nausea, headache, malaise, difficulty breathing, dizziness, etc. So these are typically seen in a jellyfish toxicity. So this is what a typical welt we are talking about, where you see a streak of uh, the tentacles that have come in contact with the skin. And this 
if there is a mild, this can be mild in the initial stages. This is another articarial rashes, which you can see on contact with the uh, venom. They can be intense itching, pain, redness, and this can lead to symptom, systematic symptoms also, like nausea, giddiness, vomiting, um, light headedness. So when we talk about severe animation, so these symptoms of having just urticarial rashes, redness, edema um, is one end of it. And then you can have probable severe animation where you have linear wells in cross hatch fashion. I'll, some, I'll share some photographs. And when there is systemic involvement within minutes, patients can collapse and there can be cardiac arrest, which can occur. The arrest can happen because of hypotension, or hypertension, tachycardia, impaired cardiac conduction, and arrhythmias. Talking about hyperkalemia that can happen, which can lead to severe arrhythmias, and that can lead to cardiac arrest. Ongoing is there is there can be a delayed hypersensitivity pruritic arrhythmic rash that can occur 7 to 14 days after the initial sting. So this is how we have, this is a severe, you can see the discrepancy in the size of the limb, the size of the thigh to the opposite side, which is normal. So if there is, this is typically a box jellyfish sting. And this can lead to cellulitis. Um, we'll talk about it further. So when do you alert? So this is, you have a jellyfish sting, you've been in touch with water. And I think um, the most important thing is watch out. When you're going into water, always watch out if there is a possibility of a jellyfish. There are always alerts put up near the uh, beach, on the beach side, that there is being spotted and from particular periods of time to when there can be a mating season. And if there is a uh, alert, please avoid water. But if you have come across and yes, you got stung, so when do you uh, remember or when do you feel that there should be an alert for emergency medical help where you need probable hospitalization? There are signs of severe envenomation and severe allergic reaction, allergic reaction going into anaphylaxis, anaphylactic reaction. Especially if there is a suspicion of a box jellyfish sting, please do not neglect it, rush the victim to the hospital or to the emergency department. And another uh, indication that there could be probably severe envenomation and there needs to be a hospitalization or at least a visit to a hospital to check out is if the sting is covering more than half the arm or leg of a or a large area, say the entire back, entire chest, entire abdomen, the possibility of severe envenomation can be there and that's when you do the first aid in the pre-hospital care but do not neglect and shift the patient to the emergency department for observation. So this is another photograph of where, you know, you can see a large portion of the thigh that has been, um, uh, what do you call, stung by a box jellyfish. Now, coming to the pre-hospital care, you've been stuck, what do you do? What are the first few steps? Number one, the precautions, yes, do not go into water if you have a suspicion of jellyfish, wear lycra clothes, completely cover yourself. In case you come across, avoid jellyfish, keep watching out when you're swimming, you're scuba diving, and when you're coming up while scuba diving, release the air so that, you know, there is uh, an alert of the jellyfish is nowhere close to you. These are the precautions that can be taken. But despite these precautions, if you are bitten, then inactivation of nematosis first thing is come out of water take out whatever clothes you have and expose the wound where the jellyfish has come in contact with inactivation of the nematosis with vinegar or acetic acid for at least 30 seconds or until the pain subsides is the first step we do this actually prevents the further release of venom from the tentacles which have come in contact with the skin uh, remember one thing, do not wash with fresh water. Fresh water continues or stimulates the tentacles to release more venom. So wash with saline or wash with sea water if you don't have vinegar with you and inactivate the nematosis. Then after this has been done, please take antihistamine drug. As Dr. Kriya was telling about your first aid kit that needs to be carried, vinegar, antihistamine, analgesic, mandatory as part alcohol, 70% alcohol, normal saline, 
Uh, these are the drugs Benadryl, an antihistaminic again, which is a first line of uh, drug that can be used. These are mandatory part of the first aid kit. It should be taken when you're going to the seaside or oceanside for a swim or for other recreational activities like scuba diving or snorkeling, etc. So um, first is inactivation of nematosis with vinegar or acetic acid or alcohol or seawater or normal saline. Antihistaminic drug, painkillers. And then the one thing which prevents the toxin to get washed away is a hot shower or a hot water soak. And the, it's been observed in the Asiatic areas that 40 to 45 degrees of hot water, which doesn't scald the skin for at least 20 to 40 minutes is what is going to ease out the pain significantly and wash away the toxins. But you have to ensure that the skin does not scald. Either you soak the contacted area or the stung area in hot water uh, for about 20 to 45 minutes or go for a hot shower for the uh, same duration of time. Having done this, there is a possibility of not just, you know, the tiny uh, jellyfish which uh, was shown to you that could enter your mouth, it could cause a sting, it can cause a sting in the eye. So in case you have envenomation in the eye or in the oral cavity, if it's in the oral cavity, there is a mixture of dilution of vinegar one fourth percent and three fourths of saline as a combination and repeated gargling with that to get rid of the pain is the first pre-hospital care that can be taken. Once you go to the emergency department, there's going to be obviously antihistaminic or symptomatic care and there's going to be saline irrigation of the oral cavity. If it is eyes, then if it is eye or near around the eye, it can't be inside the eye. If there's a stink very close to the eye or on the eyelid, uh, cloth soaked in vinegar solution should be placed on the, eye, on the uh, stung area but do not wash the eye with vinegar. That's like the craziest thing one can do, but do not. You can do a saline irrigation of the eye repeatedly for about 20 minutes, but do not put vinegar in the eye. Then saline irrigation of yeah, the eye and the oral cavity. And while irrigating, again, I reiterate, do not use fresh water. Uh, for these and since yeah sensitive organs five senses extremely important mouth and oral cavity uh, and eye please rush the victim to the emergency for further evaluation now one is inactivation of the nematocyte next would be the tentacle removal so tentacle removal is typically done or recommended to do with the tweezer if tweezers are not available or forceps are not available, next best option is to use baking soda as a paste or um, uh, uh, what do you call, remove it with a towel or with a card, either debit card, credit card, that's what is mentioned, but any hard surface, a sharp surface with which you can scrape off the nematocytes from the skin is recommended. That is the next part where we prevent the uh, continuation of envenomation. First is inactivation, next is the tentacle removal. Removal, tentacle removal can be done with skin scrapings, apply shaving cream or baking soda, slurry and you can shave off. Shave off in the sense you can brush it off aside with a firm sharp surface. Forceps or applying sticky tape to the uh, affected area where you can you know, peel off, like waxing for ladies, I think they would understand. Men also must be having some idea about it. That's one way you can re get rid of the nematocytes. Remember, when you're doing this, do not, you preferably wear gloves. Do not brush it off with your palm because they can stink the person who is giving care to. So the basic dictum, you're safe. And that's when you can provide good safety to, good care to the person who's infected or, or sorry, who is stung by the jellyfish. Then tentacles continue to function after being separated from the jellyfish and can sting even if the jellyfish is dead. So a dead jellyfish is not dead toxin. The toxin is pretty much active. So beware of that when you're taking care of the injury site. So this is another severe envenomation where most of the leg and thigh, this is almost a near fatal case in China, which was reported where this guy has the prolonged stay of hospitalization before he recovered. 
So this is some of the brochures or uh, what do you call boards that are put up in most of the areas, um, Australia, very well, well, Philippines. This is from Philippines Coast Guard. I just took it from the internet to show that this is how well they educate people um, who come for swimming. It says carefully remove the, uh, remove the casualty from water. Casualty is the person or the victim who has been bitten by the jellyfish from the water to avoid further trauma. Avoid rubbing or scratching the stung area. Immediately irrigate the affected area with acetic acid or vinegar for at least 30 seconds. If vinegar is not available, carefully remove the tentacles from skin with tweezers and rinse well with sea water. Do not use fresh water. Monitor the casualties, pulse and breathing. Be aware of possible onset of anaphylactic shock. Urine is not an effective method of treatment and can worsen the condition. So no betting on making one pee on the other. It's not going to work out because it can worsen the condition by introducing sepsis, cellulitis and worsening the... It was thought initially because of ammonia and urea, it could have a similar action like vinegar, but it is a myth. It is contraindicated. It is not to be used in a jellyfish poisoning or jellyfish toxicity and renovation. So this is the Philippines Coast Guard and they've put up, I think most of the pre-hospital care is covered in this. And uh, yes, we, I can't overemphasize on awareness on BLS, basic life support, where in case there is um, respiratory arrest or a cardiac arrest, so one needs to know how to check pulse and how to start CPR. CPR in the fashion that is being taught has to be age guidelines. And once the patient, this sort of in severe innovation, when these patients are brought to the hospital, that's when you call the hospital emergency ambulance services. There is ACLS initiated on them and yeah, intubation ABCs are taken care of. So this is another, um, uh, I think very nicely put uh, picture for, new, for uh, visitors in the sea area in Australia, where there is uh, especially box jellyfish. So they've given very clear instructions as to what are the five steps that need to be done in case of jellyfish attack in the pre-hospital setting. So get out of the water immediately. Do not scrape the tentacles off with hands or wet sand, as this can cause the stinging cells to release more venom on the body. Pour vinegar on the offset, on the affected area for 30 seconds. To stop the stinging cells from releasing the venom, remove the tentacles from the body using a towel or a pair of tweezers and med get medical help soon. I think this is so beautifully put up in the five simple steps of pre-hospital care when we are a probable there is a, uh, this is I think an advertisement that needs to be put up in most of the areas where there are jellyfish availability. So it says that they can cause cardiac and respiratory arrest aside from excruciating pain. There will be many large red wells in the body where the tentacles get stuck. So that is an alert for people who are going for swimming. So be careful. Do not be reckless. Do not be overconfident or underestimate mother nature. So myth busting. Will home remedies work? There are a lot of home remedies, which I'm sure people living in the coastal areas, they might be thinking, yeah, this is uh, jellyfish. We played with jellyfish as a growing boy or a growing girl. But there have been some myths which show that there is no evidence that they actually work for a jellyfish poisoning. Like, for example, rubbing with sand. Whichever the affected site, there's a belief that you take sand and you rub it and that's when you know you're going to abrade the skin and thereby remove the tentacles it is absolutely a no-no it might actually stimulate the tentacles to release further venom and cause more damage and more envenomation meat tenderizer is also ineffective baking soda has been found to some extent to cause a little bit of pain relief but there but that also is not really proven to be the gold standard treatment for Animation. Pressure bandages, so that you know to prevent the toxin, you must be seen in Hindi movies. Either you suck out the blood or you put a tourniquet around so that the toxin doesn't spread into the systemic circulation. These do not help, they cause further damage to the tissue and um, yeah, may go for amputation and necrosis also. Uh, urination over the affected area is an absolute no no. Alcohol. 70% alcohol to some extent has found to have a similar effect uh, like vinegar, but that again is a 
questionable thing. They're not found alcohol. 70% alcohol is a sterilizer or a sanitizer has proven sometimes, but vinegar is still by default the gold standard in treatment. Scraping out stingers is another no-no. It will stimulate to cause further um, venom release. Rinse with fresh water, a no-no. Rub with the towel also is a no-no if not done in a proper way. So, box jellyfish, I let, I'm almost finishing. Box jellyfish is responsible for thousands of stings each year. Dangerous bloats, long, huge, very beautiful looking, but extremely dangerous. They cause intense local pain and dermal edema, may cause death due to respiratory arrest and coma due to neurotoxins. And the patients are often found dead before they could even come out because of the Neurotoxicity leading to intracranial hemorrhage or uh, bleed or uh, respiratory arrest and paralysis and muscular spasms leading to inability to swim. So when they come in contact with a box jellyfish and if it's a bad severe inflammation, they may not have the capacity to swim offshore ashore, and actually take care of their wounds. They cannot and they go into paralysis and that's what leads to death. So... That is uh, about box jellyfish. Now, since we finished the pre-hospital care, let's talk about what I do for a living. That's emergency department management. First and foremost is reassurance. Reassurance to the patient and to the family that they are in safe hands, that they can then, and that the best possible is going to be done to them. That eases out a lot of anxiety. Then if the hot shower, one of the main treatments is one is neutralizing the venom. Next is removal of the tentacles, antihistamines. And then there is a hot shower that will actually for about uh, 40 to 45 degrees of hot water or about 20 to 45 minutes is what would cause the toxin to go away and to give a lot of uh, analysis here. If that is not done, that can be provided if there's a decontamination zone that is present in the emergency department. Simple analgesics also can be done given if it's a simple case, if it's a severe inflammation, excruciating pain, over the counter drugs, acetaminophen, acetaminophen can work, or uh, opioid analgesics work fantastically well. Antihistamine drugs, first, if it is a uh, pre hospital area, talk about uh, Benadryl, that is chlorpheniramine, a drug of choice. And in hospital, also, we have multiple antihistamines that can be given. In case there is hypertension, there is patient is going into anaphylaxis, steroids can be given. Antibiotics, if yes, there has been urination, there's been a lot of contamination with sand, and there is cellulitis, that kind of picture that is present, antibiotics may be initiated. But antibiotics are not necessarily need to be given for uh, jellyfish envenomation. Tetanus toxoid injection, if not taken in the recent 10 years, I'm surprised, actually it surprises me many times, um, a lot of doctors, which I've seen in my medical practice, every time there's an injury, every time construction workers, especially laborers, um, you know, welding guys and all these fellows, whenever they have an injury, they end up getting a TT. But a TT is valid for 10 years. So if there's a TT which has been given in the last 10 years, we do not need to repeat. If it is not given, then a tetanus shot can be given to the, it should be given to patients who come with envenomation. And observe them for some period of time, taking very careful, very close monitoring of the airway, breathing, and circulation. And discharge if the symptoms are improving with uh, uh, alert to them and counseling that in the next few days also, 7 to 14 days, if they see any kind of a discoloration, necrosis, tissue damage, that they will have to think about a the toxin that is causing, continuing to cause a damage to the tissues and that they will have to come back to the emergency department or to the hospital for further checkup and management. Any treatment for severe envenomation, mandatory, they're automatically taken into the resuscitation bay. There is a cardiac monitor that's hooked up to them. You have ECG leads. We're talking about hyperkalemia. We're talking about extreme tachycardia. And I'll just say good IV axis. So airway breathing, in case there is a respiratory arrest, we go ahead with the intubation and mechanical ventilation and uh, oxygen supplementation. So airway taken care of, breathing taken care of, coming to IV axis, 
good patent to IV accesses because if they are severe inflammation, usually patients present with tachycardia and hypotension, they're in anaphylactic shock. So adrenaline would be the first drug of choice that is given to them before we can get an IV access on them. So there's hypertension with tachycardia, hypotension with tachycardia, 0.5 milligrams of one in thousand units of epinephrine is given as an IM injection, which can be repeated every 15 minutes till the uh, hypotension is reversed or the anaphylaxis is getting better. In the meantime, there is the airway breathing and circulation that can be taken care of and getting two wide bore accesses for fluid boluses and drugs is mandatory when we are dealing with, when we are dealing with severe administration. We do not have to go for a central venous axis. A good decent size that is 18 gauge and below peripheral IV axis is sufficient to take care of anaphylaxis. Box jellyfish antivenom, antivenin is available in most of these places which uh, encounter um, envenomation with box jellyfish. So three ampules. So the way it goes is one ampule contains 20,000 units and uh, child, irrespective of the age, the um, dosage would not change. Like TT would be the same for a newborn baby to uh, somebody who is 60 years old be same 0.5 ml. Similarly, antivenin also is 20,000 units to be given as a slow IV infiltration, uh, IV infusion for people who have come with severe envenomation with box jellyfish stinging. If there is a cardiac arrest as a presentation and we have enough evidence that it is a box jellyfish that is responsible or any of these marine envenomation, a trial of six ampules of antivenom as an IV infusion, when CPR going on, with the resuscitation, with the complete ACLS protocols going on, can be given as during as part of resuscitation. So when we have the 5Hs and 5Ts we talk about in uh, ACLS, we have toxins as one of the Ts of um, cardiac arrest. So the antidote or the antivenom for any of these marine toxins given as part of resuscitation is a um, very strong indication, a very strong chances of the patient achieving return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC can be attained. If a refractory, so cardiac arrest presentation is usually in the form of torsades or a VT or a VF. So there is an arrhythmia that can be presenting a rhythm or an opening rhythm for a cardiac arrest. And if these envenomation is not working out, fluid bolus is not working out, epinephrine not working out, magnesium is given as a one gram bolus, IV direct IV push is given as part of resuscitation for severe envenomation. And yeah, then we do the best. We continue the ACLS protocol and the CPR and uh, take care of the lactates and the calcium gluconate, which goes into picture and the acidosis that ensues, all these things are taken care of and it goes as per the ACLS guidelines. But the one thing we will remember as an underlying factor is that the toxin has caused this uh, cardiac arrest and we address it by giving antivenom. So typically indicated, yes, it is raised in horse and sheep, maybe antigenic, it is an antigenic to humans and typically recommended Yes, so when we are giving for, uh, not in cardiac arrest, but when somebody presents with a severe envenomation to the uh, ER, like anti-snake or whatever, you we, um, should give a skin testing prior to administration if clinical situation permits. Usually should permit. We wait for about 15 to 30 minutes while we prepare the whole thing. And typical wheel and erythema should appear at the, it's an intradermal injection which we give in the forearm, in the inner aspect. And a positive test requires a antihistaminic pretreatment and a dilution of antivenom significantly and close monitoring and observation. So dosage again, the same for children and adults, 20,000 units in one while, diluted in normal saline and infusion is given. If we are unable to attain an IV access for whatever reason, then one way of de dealing in pre-hospital, uh, in uh, primary healthcare centers or in peripheries where, you know, very closest to the coastal areas, that we infiltrate three vials of uh, the drug in three different sites, deep intramuscularly as part of Antivenom, uh, anti uh, what do you call uh, antivenom for the toxin. So 
So either it's given one vial is given as an IV infusion or three vials in three different sites given IM is a next alternative option if IV is not available. Then we come to this um, Irukanji syndrome. I'm sure seen that tiny um, jellyfish that can be lethal absolutely. It's poorly understood. It's characterized by severe excruciating pain. Uh, and quite interestingly, this causes a sympathomimetic state where there can be hypotensive emergency. And uh, so this is the uh, the baby jellyfish or the miniature jellyfish that can be so lethal. So clinical presentation is initial sting generally not felt. It's so tiny, I guess. I guess. Leads to short period before systemic symptoms develop. Systemic symptoms, how are they present? We have multiple systemic effects which occur 30 to 90 minutes after the possible stinging with, where the patient presents with agitation, dysphoria, vomiting, diaphoresis, ex ex severe uh, back pain, limb pain, abdominal pain. If this would present, we would think of definitely a different oxydrome and maybe not a jellyfish poison. So this has to be kept in mind that this also can be because of a jellyfish um, stinging. So intracranial hemorrhage is a common presentation. So patients present with agitation dysphoria, we get a CT brain plane, we see that there is intracranial hemorrhage that can be present. Um, so hypertensive emergency and tachycardia are common in um, these, just, just a second please. So that can be present. A uh, rare presentation is a life-threatening hypotension, which is, I think, the later part of the initial hypertensive crisis, and apnea, which may develop leading to cardiovascular collapse and um, eventually death. So, um, treatment for uh, Irukandji uh, syndrome is Irukandji syndrome is um, supportive care. A, a very close monitoring of the patient with uh, like ready availability of a crash card with uh, uh, you know care that can be given in the best form for the airway breathing and circulation. Hyperadrenergic state that is presented can be treated with NTG and pentolamine. It has found that they have very good effects in getting the pressures under control. Benzodiazepines also actually reduce the anxiety and uh, the panic state and they also help in getting the pressures down. Magnesium also has uh, helped in causing analgesic effect and thereby reducing the hyperadrenergic state and bringing the pressures down. Uh, opioid analgesics are also used and uh, antivenin and good supportive care for the symptoms of presentation is what needs to be addressed. So in summary, if we come, uh, if I talk, how do we treat? Treatment, the prevention is better than cure. So avoid contact, first of all, with jellyfish. Do not go close to them and get stung. And they are very, they are an enigma. They're so beautiful. They're so transparent. So please don't go and fidget with them. Don't go into their abode. Don't trespass and avoid them as much as possible. Despite all that, if you are stung, avoid home remedies and follow simple four steps of vinegar, antihistaminic, tentacle removal and hot water bath as part of the pre-hospital care. Please avoid home remedies, avoid urination, rubbing with sand over the stung areas. They are harmful and they do not cause any help and they do not cause any better mental symptoms. Identify severe envenomation as the earliest. Always be overcautious. Overdiagnosing is always better than underdiagnosing and relaxing and rush the patient to hospital for observation and assessment. Vinegar is a must carry along when trying snorkeling, scuba diving, or going into areas where there's a possibility of a jellyfish habitat. When you go into their habitat, be prepared with the first aid kit. So first aid kit should have vinegar, tweezers, normal saline, alcohol, antihistaminic, analgesic, and a tape for pulling out the uh, stingers. Thank you.